Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I have to be bad. If I'm actually, if I'm really working on something, it's not going to be good all the time. It's going to be good. Like, but then when I do it again, it might get a little better. Hi. Listeners, hello. This is Jack. I am here with a very special guest today. And no, I'm not talking about the uh, four-time Emmy-winning actress that you just heard a snippet from. Ben, do you want to reintroduce yourself? Hello. Uh, Yeah. Hi, listeners of In the Envelope. (laughs) This is Benjamin Lindsay, Managing Editor here at Backstage. So I'm calling in from my Brooklyn apartment. We're all just kind of making it work. Thanks for listening. We are still making it work. Yes. Thank you for um, for joining us. What's going on in your neck of the woods? What's going on at Backstage this week? Yeah, well, th- this week we, we are still... Uh, the majority of my responsibilities here at Backstage, under that umbrella falls the print magazine. Um, and we are still running the print magazine during these kind of unprecedented times of mm-hmm. the... Uh, coronavirus pandemic. So we have the May 21st issue hitting stands the same day that this Laura Linney interview is coming out. Right. On the cover for that, um, it is our spotlight issue for commercials. So um, we have Anna Kendrick on our cover. Um, she has a new series called Love Life on HBO Max mm-hmm. that she tells us all about. But Basically, we talked to her about all facets of her career kind of framed and uh, capped off with her commercial work, interestingly enough. Um, And then throughout that issue, we also have interviews with agents, commercial agents, commercial casting directors, talking about trends in the industry, talking specifically Mm -hmm. about um, how this uh, current state of the world is changing things in the world of commercials. Um, And then, of course, our casting notices and regular service content that we run on a weekly basis. So, um, totally. yeah, so, so that, that is the quick rundown or maybe long winded rundown of, uh, <laughs> no. of what's happening this week with the print magazine. We're very excited to be still producing these. So, uh, if you're a print subscriber, keep an eye on your mailbox, you'll be seeing Anna Kendrick there shortly. Totally. It is very cool that we're continuing to do print issues amid all of this. And like, even just getting a photo shoot done with Anna Kendrick was kind of its own, like ordeal that ended up working out really well. I mean, the photos look amazing. So yeah. Yeah. We're thrilled with how everyone kind of came together. We've had to get creative with these photo shoots to say the least. (laughs) Um, But it's all, it's all coming together and everyone is kind of on board to, uh, to get creative. So it's, it's interesting times. We're adapting really well, I think to the times and yeah, continuing to kind of provide users of backstage and our audience, just the, the resources, the advice, the, guide to the industry i would think it's a guide to the industry in general in addition to being like a guide to the industry in the in this amid this global pandemic yeah certainly certainly and i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure you've touched on it um on this podcast before because we've been recording during this pandemic but um Mm -hmm. that's also seen in our slate offerings just this week we've sat down with casting director linda lamontaine um who is world famous for her work in the voiceover field so that's that's kind of a booming, exactly. a booming medium within acting and casting right now. Um, mm-hmm. So to pick her brain for for that hour session earlier this week was great. We had Robert Ulrich on the line last week. Right. Um, talent agent Jason Lockhart joined us at one point. We we're really kind of uh, ramping up the casting director and agent content on the slate. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone needs to check out the slate. Our our schedule for the slate is updated 
basically by the minute. I mean, our whole team is working to book talent and book industry leaders to provide inspiration, to provide advice, to provide resources for anyone who wants to um, tune in. Some of this stuff is tune in right as it happens, and some of it you can catch later. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we'll be sure to link to all of the resources in the slate in this week's episode. But um, yeah, it's funny you were saying commercials earlier because Laura Linney, at the end of this uh, fabulous, fabulous interview, she actually does mention commercial work. It's one of the many, many things that Laura Linney has done. Right. The laundry list. I know. We're, yeah. We're both huge fans of her. I mean, I don't want to oversell this episode, but listeners, you're in for like, if it's an hour of like pure, unfiltered advice, technical and career advice gold, like you've, you've come to the right episode of this podcast. She really does just know how to speak an actor's language in a way that very few exactly. actors can. It is so, um, it's a mm. breath of fresh air for anyone who's listening to trying to get that really yeah. nitty gritty craft advice. She's, she's one of the totally the go-to people that you should go to. And we, we are lucky enough to have her this week. Yeah, totally. It's, it's like, it's textbook stuff, which makes it sound far less charming than she, I mean, she's hilarious. She's super fun to oh, talk yeah, to. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this interview is just a really great example of that. And um, yeah, I want to get to it. So thank you, Ben, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for letting me uh, chime in for a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure we will hear from you soon. Listeners, uh, episodes of this podcast are coming out weekly, but spoiler alert, they are going to be more than weekly for the foreseeable future. So continue to stay tuned. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Enjoy the episode, guys. Yeah. Hello, In the Envelope listener. If you are a theater lover looking to learn more about Broadway, may I suggest checking out our friends over at The Ensemblist. Their podcast takes you inside the theater with Broadway performers from Hadestown to Hamilton. In their candid 20-minute episodes, The Ensemblist takes on diversity, Broadway history, and so, so much more. Seriously, check it out. It is terrific. Search for The Ensemblist on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Three-time Oscar nominee, four-time Tony nominee, and four-time Emmy Award winner Laura Linney is known for her technical prowess and innate humanity on stage and screen. The star of John Adams, The Savages, The Big C, and 12 Broadway shows, including this year's My Name is Lucy Barton, Laura has steeped herself in the craft of acting since her childhood in New York and training at Juilliard. She now stars as Wendy Bird in Ozark. Netflix's crime drama from Bill Dubuque, Mark Williams, and Jason Bateman, which last year earned Laura her sixth Emmy nod. Here's our chat with the masterful Laura Linney. Laura Linney, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us on uh, on Backstage's podcast. My pleasure. Happy to be here. You sound great. Whereabouts well, are you? <laughs> I'm in the northwest corner of Connecticut. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Just hunker down. Are you uh, keeping busy? What's your quarantine life like? Well, I'm hunkered down. I'm here with my husband and my six-year-old. And okay. so I am homeschooling him. Wow. Which is keeping me so busy. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's, uh, my, I always, I always had great appreciation for teachers, but yes. like many of us now, it's just through the roof. I, yes. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> trying yes. to keep the, the focus of a six year old, you know, they, and because I'm his mother, he just wants none of it. So it's been a challenge. Oh, sure, sure. And it's sort of awkward. Like, if this, it's an awkward amount of time, I feel like, until the end of the year. Like, it's, there's only about a month left. I know. So it's like we all have to completely revise how these kids are educated, but then it'll be summertime all of a sudden. Yeah. Yes, I know. So it's all unknown territory for everybody. Yeah, yeah. It is a very weird. I was, you know, obviously was really hoping to uh, do these interview, do these podcast recordings in person, but sure. <laughs> I know we're gonna do the we're gonna ma- we're managing the best we can. I know. I hope that when this is over and we and our lives continue on. We're on the other side of this. Who knows what that will look like? 
but I, I certainly hope that people will want people to come back in and do this in person. I hope that now that we realize it's possible to do it this way, that people won't just clam onto this. Yeah, well, and like you were saying about appreciating teachers, I appreciated theater and live entertainment and the, the act of coming together to experience art, but it is a renewed appreciation for it yes, now. I know. <laughs> well, it's, it's never been fully taken away from us before, so it's... Right. It's, and, you know, the fear of looking in the future and realizing it might not restore for many years is, you know, is, just makes me despondent. Same. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you, so you were affected by this just like everyone else in terms of, but you did have some interesting timing with your, your Broadway show had wrapped up yeah. and Ozark was set to be released. It was released right on schedule, kind of just after everything was shut down. So, I mean, going forward, what else did you have in the pipeline or how else was your, was your career affected by this? Well, there was a movie I was supposed to do in mm. Ireland in July, which now is being pushed to whenever we can do it. Oh, wow. And then, you know, that was that was it, really. And then, you know, hopefully when and if Ozark is renewed for a fourth season, which I am pretty sure it will be, <laughs> uh, you know, we'll we'll go back to work whenever we can. But I don't know how I don't know how a crew comes back to work. I, I just don't know what that looks like. And I'm sure everybody is scratching their heads and trying to figure out how that how do you keep a group of people healthy when there is still a virus running around right until there's a guarantee there's uh, especially with with all things with hollywood and production i I, scratching your heads is a is the very apt phrase we all don't know no yeah have no idea it's a very it's a very strange thing then you also get into like insurance companies and mm-hmm. will they insure a group of people with a virus that's extant and mm. how do crew members stay safe? How does, you know, how do grips and electrics, you know, pass one piece of equipment to, to someone else? Yeah. And do, does everyone have to wear gloves all the time, which I think they will, you know, does mm. everyone have to be, you know, I just don't, I just don't know how that looks. And then if an actor gets sick, God forbid. Right then what happens does the yeah. whole thing shut down for three weeks like i don't i just don't know how it i'm, right. I'm sure these are all questions that everyone is asking themselves at that you know who deals with production at that level so it's right it, it's sort of it's a we'll see what happens i just have no idea and that all of what you just described sounds like more of a financial like risk or even investment too and of course we're in the middle of a recession now so sure it's sort of doubly uncertain yeah, sure. It's, but uh, oh my gosh, I'm fascinated by the idea that uh, Ozark would not come back for a fourth season. I'm assuming it does too, because oh boy, oh boy, if that were the series finale. <laughs> yeah. like I, I, I have a hard time believing that that's the series <laughs> finale. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll be. The official pickup isn't, hasn't happened, but right. um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident we'll, we'll go back to work at one point. Mm-hmm. Which, is, which is great. I mean, it's such a terrific show. And I definitely want to ask you about Ozark, all things Ozark and all things Wendy. Um, but as you know, we're backstage. We're all about the acting career and craft advice, especially early career stuff. Sure. Um, and uh, I would love for you to take us back to maybe even the very beginning because you are the daughter of a playwright, correct? I am, yeah. And so your introduction to the arts was was mostly in that realm. Like, did you, did you ever have a a moment of, oh, I'm going to become an actor? Or was it more of a slow burn? Well, I always knew I wanted to be in the theater. I didn't okay. know where that was. Mm-hmm. I I had an instinct that it would be acting, but it, it was very hard for me to come out and say that. Mm. I, it took me a long time until, until I was really a senior in high school to, even though it was obvious, to fess up and say, this <laughs> is, I want to be an actress. Um, I, I felt like that was something I had to earn. That was not something I could just sort of oh. throw out into the air. <laughs> so I was a little, I was shy about it. Um, so I worked backstage for a long time. Mm-hmm. I went to summer stock theaters when, and at the new London barn playhouse and at Keene summer theater. And I worked years and years there backstage. And then at Keene, I actually was an acting apprentice hired to actually be on mm-hmm. stage. That was the first time that I was, hired to do anything like that professionally. And then I went to college because I knew I wanted 
um, a real solid education. And mm-hmm. I studied theater history was my, was my major. Very cool. And then went on to Juilliard to get trained because mm-hmm. I knew I needed that. <laughs> ah, okay. I really knew I needed that. And, um, and that's really, for me, that was the big important moment was getting into yeah. that school. That's sort of, sort of the foundation of, of everything. Um, right. You said you needed to get trained. I mean, that was just a, a matter of adding tools to your toolbox? Well, it was a lot of things. It was that I knew that I, I, if I wanted a life in this profession, mm-hmm. I needed to know how to solve problems along the way. And I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have the experience to do that. And also I had, I had watched a lot. I used to go around to regional theaters with my father when he was having plays done. And I would watch these beautiful young actresses, these ingenues who were so glorious. Mm -hmm. And I would watch them age into leading lady and they just couldn't do it. Like something happened where instinct stopped and they had no technique. Mm -hmm. And I would watch them just sort of disintegrate. And that was when I realized, oh, I need to go get trained. That's interesting. I, I, really, I really need to know what I'm doing. Because instinct is delicious and it's mm-hmm. wonderful, but it will only take you so far. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, you, uh, you have to either have just an inherent actor brain that will bridge you to the next level, or you need to go get trained. Interesting. So, I, that's just what I saw, and that was just sort of what I understood to be true. So I applied to to drama schools out of college and was somehow by the grace of God, got into, got into Juilliard. Hmm. And it, and it was building that foundation that you say, that's interesting that it's because you saw examples of other actresses, even other, is it, is it sort of about type where you wanted to get enough skills in order to be able to play a variety of types? No, I just, I wanted to be able to do this for a very long time. Right. So I, mm. I didn't, it wasn't really about type. It was just about, I, I knew I wanted to go learn from people who knew much more than I did. Mm. <laughs> I wanted to soak up as much as I could from, from people who had been studying this for a very long time. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, and I also knew that there was a very big difference between having the idea of something, of wanting to be able to do something, and then the ability to execute it. Right. And I know I needed some help with that. And then I just knew that there was just a lot I just didn't know. That I had good instincts and that I had a great Mm -hmm. education and I had already had exposure and access to theater my entire life. But I just had a sense that there was, I just needed and wanted more. Mm -hmm. And I I needed and wanted to study. You know, I I didn't have the lure to go start working right away to work professionally, or I I didn't have that. Some Mm. people do, and that's Mm. great. Um, But mine was really like, I want to study, I want to study, I want to study. I want to learn about the people who came before me. I want to know what people are doing now. I want to see maybe where the theater is going in the future. Mm. So that was all. I, I wanted to make some tiny contribution to something that had been going on for centuries before me oh that's beautiful you know so so i wanted to go learn as much as i could before i started absolutely wow the tiny contribution that's that's really spot on that all will be (laughs) it will be a tiny little (laughs) contribution (laughs) no as that's as much as any of us can do but it will will keep it moving forward and that's what's important (laughs) especially in the theater it's very ephemeral these kinds of things are very ephemeral Absolutely. And it changes with each culture and our culture is, you know, yeah. all is fascinating right now. So what does theater do for us now? You know, what does it provide now? Right. Um, and what, what have we taken from what the people who came before us, what have they given us to allow us to do what we're doing now? Sure. Yeah. And what are we passing on? You know, hmm. the baton that our, generation has passing it to the next group of people although they already have it really i'm on the a further side but <laughs> you know what what are they running with you know what have we what have we given them what example have we given them you know how have we showed them how to work why we work the purpose of the work mm-hmm. you know all of all of those things that's really cool that i feel like that's a really interesting way to think about legacy and yes, most people yeah. think of yeah like 
legacy is maybe more generally thought of as a straightforward, like what I have accomplished or what I have achieved and how that will be remembered. But you're more conscious of this longstanding tradition and how you are one in a line of it, like generationally. Yeah, and, it, and it flows through you. You know, you're right. just, you're, you're one little part. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, what has been done before is going to flow through you and onto someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And it's cyclical, but it's also always brand new. Yes. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You know, you can never recreate. Mm -hmm. You just create. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. But things, but things will will flow through you, you know. Mm. Beautiful. Um, and you've, of course, you've spoken about your your quote unquote process before. We usually, you know, we try to ask about how do you approach every every character, every script, every role, and okay. it all came. Uh, I'm sure a lot of it came from your from your Juilliard training. But I'm wondering too, like you've spoken about a script focused approach, and did that just come from the instincts? like from your childhood from having a playwright for a father oh i'm sure i'm sure that's a huge part of it and, and what juilliard did was just give me options and then mm -hmm. once you get out of school then you figure out your own technique like what do you do how do cool. you use these things what so you have all these options but now and then you get to be diagnostic um mm -hmm. so for me i try to i try to approach everything differently Mm -hmm. I try to, but I tend to be script based. If the script is good, <laughs> if the <laughs> script isn't good, then you go about it a different way. <laughs> okay, because um, you can't you can't have something that's not sound be the foundation of what you're doing. So mm. you can go about it another way, but you have to learn how to be diagnostic about that and figure. Okay, if I can't approach it this way, how do I? How do I do it? So, but I tend to be script centric. Mm -hmm. and try and see the clues and try and see the narrative and try and see the topography of how a story is crafted. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it is crafted. <laughs> right. And try and tell the story. So it's always story first. Mm -hmm. You've said before too, that it's about putting yourself in the shoes of the writer. Uh, a, li a little bit as far as seeing like what they're giving you, like mm -hmm. the clues within punctuation, the, you know, what they're, what they've given you to to play mm -hmm. and how then you fit into a bigger thing right um, right yes so you're not just thinking about the characters uh subplots and the characters specific part of the story you are thinking about the overarching narrative absolutely and also what's my job you know what is mm. from a, a playwriting standpoint what's the what's this character doing to the story mm -hmm. how do i how am I helping move the story forward? Mm. What is my job within this scene? So th mm. this is like one one string of of what you examine, you know. And then yes. you get into character work, and then you get into all that stuff. But then there's one string of it is what's the function within the play of this character? So cool. is my job to move this other character forward? Am I help? Do I come into the scene and help move the protagonist to his next moment or her mm. next moment? Do I, you know, what's the? Am I the obstacle? Cool. Am I, yeah. do I ignite something? Do I like, what's, what's the, um, why is the playwright having me do what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. Do you also think about tone? Is it about your character contributing to or establishing a kind of tone or rhythm? You can, I mean, you certainly can do that, but that's, I, I sort of try to lean on directors for, for that. Gotcha. Okay. You know, and, try, and tone is a result of something. Not the, not the, per, it's not attacking tone first. It's attacking the character and the plot. Yes. Yeah. And then tone will reveal itself. Gotcha. Yeah. You know? um, and you'll find the tone along the way, but right. tone, and, you know, emotional pitch and all that sort of ephemeral stuff tends to be the result of, of the more nuts and bolts stuff mm -hmm. for me anyway. Right. And a lot of it is like is getting that nuts and bolts stuff done early and done thoroughly and then letting it all go and then yeah. letting it sort of take off a little bit and see and see where it goes. That's very cool. But for me anyway, I try to be as prepared as I can possibly be. That doesn't mean I'm off book when I walk into a room. I never am. Um, okay. it, it means that you're still you're you're prepared so that you can be flexible. Mm -hmm. you're, you're prepared so that you can then really move around and explore without 
falling off the balance beam, mm, you know? Mm-hmm. And everything you're describing, of, I'm sure, is also true for, for TV and film, but correct me if I'm wrong, mostly in the, in the beginning of your career, especially right after Juilliard, the focus was on theater. It was, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, how, and did the, the, how did the next step, how did TV and film enter the picture? Well, really, it was a big surprise. <laughs> it was sort of not my intention to work in, in film and television. Mm-hmm. And I was shy about it and I was nervous about it and I just didn't understand it. And it was sort of a f- alien world I didn't know anything about. And, and I had friends who were really gung-ho about having careers in film and television. I mm-hmm. thought that was fantastic for them, but just not really necessarily. I didn't think I would fit in terribly well there. And I had a very, very smart, wise agent by the name of Brian Reardon, who's, who's no longer alive, but he was incredibly influential. And he sort of really understood me. And mm. he just said, you know, why don't you, why don't we try and see if we can get you a day on something and you can go see if you like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was very, very smart with me. And, and so I did, I did one day on this, I did two days on something else. And cool. then by the time I was cast in Tales of the City, mm-hmm. which was my first really big um, camera job, mm-hmm. where I was in something from beginning to end, you know, I'd had a little bit of experience. So I, I knew enough so that I wouldn't be terrified when I walked mm-hmm. on set. Um, but then all of a sudden when I was doing Tales, I, I had a moment where I was like, oh, <laughs> I might enjoy this, you know, if I, if I allow it to be its own thing, if I try not to apply the rules of the theater onto this, if my expectations are different, you know, maybe I could actually enjoy this. Maybe I wouldn't suck at it. Um, And maybe it would make me a better actress. Will it make me a better stage actress? And, 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 you know, a whole world opened up to me that I had, I had no idea that I was going to be doing as much camera work as I have been and that, and that I would enjoy it as much as I do. Interesting. So they, so the, the two mediums are uh, thought of pretty separately in your mind. Film and television or uh, stage. Yeah. Stage and screen. Yeah. There are three for me. They're very, Oh, different. there's three. Okay. Yeah. For me, there's three. Yeah. Because with television, with most television work, if you're doing a series, mm-hmm. you don't know what's coming. Yeah. You don't have all the information. So you have to approach it differently. Right. That's one similarity between film and theater is that there's an end point. That's right. You're t- you, have, you have the whole story. Mm-hmm. So you can craft something from beginning to end. And you know that that's your job. And with, with long-term television, you have to be a little open because you, yeah. don't, know what, you don't know what's coming. So you can't tr- really make, you can't really cement yourself to... Mm. You have to give yourself a way out mm-hmm. if need be, because mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. can get caught. <laughs> right. Technically, you have to be a little careful. Yeah. <laughs> right. You don't want to paint you or the writers into a corner when you're on exactly. the TV show. That's Very exactly right. That's right. Yeah. And you don't want to start something that then you can't see through to the end. That's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's you know, sort of not fair to an audience or, or, or to yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, so I have to tell you, I wrote this note down because I wanted to tell you this, that on the second episode ever of this podcast, we had Andrew Rannells on. Oh, you and, did? <laughs> who, I'm, who I know you know, because yes. he told this story where we, I, I don't know how it came up, but we were, start, we were talking about the difference between acting for stage and acting for screen. Uh-huh. And he said that you told him that the tip that he keeps in mind the most, which is that when you are on stage and it's snowing, that you have to kind of make a gesture and put your arm out and maybe do a little bit of a, ooh, I'm cold to kind of indicate yeah. it's snowing. But when you are doing it on camera, it's just snowing. It's just snowing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you yeah. don't have to quote unquote fake it as right. as big maybe. That's right. There are other things <laughs> doing the job for you. Right, right. You know, you have to let other departments do their job. And then you have to get out of the way of that. You can't compete with that. Yeah, okay, You need cool. to let that happen. And like, where do you fit into the balance of everything? Mm-hmm. You know, I remember on the first movie I did, or one of them was a movie called Lorenzo's Oil. And I had this long mm-hmm. walk. I came out of a school schoolhouse building downstairs, across the street, down the street. I had this long walk. And at one point, a leaf blew by and it was fall. And, all, and, I, and I realized 
I didn't have to create the leaf. I didn't have to react to the leaf. <laughs> like there was really a leaf going by. And I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to create a lot. I had to just do my part of it and, and let the other mm -hmm. stuff support me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you sort of learn that they're, they're, they're very different animals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think of it as like tennis and swimming. They're okay. both athletic, but they're very, very different. Yeah, yeah. So it sort of frees you up to think about your your one role in the whole production process that's and right. everything else that's not a part of that you you let go of. That's right. That's right. Like hair and makeup ain't your job. Right, right. You can contribute to it, but it's not your job. Like you were saying about like direction and direction being about tone to right. to an extent that's that's your responsibility, but mostly that's what the director is there for. And also the editor. You know, editors, oh, sure. you know, television and film is really made in an editing room and, and pacing and all that stuff is, is um, you can certainly try mm -hmm. to do that. And, and I do, but it can be completely changed in the editing room. It's shocking how things can be completely Absolutely. reworked tonally and pace wise. And, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And also sound, like what the difference of, that sound can make. Ooh in film and television is enormous. It can change everything. Interesting. So it's, it's when you get knowledgeable about what happens technically with film and television, it's really fun. Yes. You know, when you, when you become adapted, realizing like what's the resources that you have at your disposal and really what's your job and what isn't your job. It's, uh, it's exciting. Mm. Totally. Well, and of course, we can talk about this part more, but to the extent that you can control or weigh in on what projects you're working on, like, do you try to mix it up? Theater, film, TV, theater, film, TV. Um, I, you know, I, I wish I could tell you I had that power, <laughs> but exactly. most people don't. <laughs> right. Really, people don't. But I do try, and I, I get uncomfortable if I'm away from the theater for too long. Okay. I get really, I really get uncomfortable. Like, I just don't know who I am anymore. So I... I really need to, you know, to, to be in a rehearsal space with other people and I need to have a tech rehearsal. I need to, <laughs> I need the schedule, the rhythm of a theater life. Mm -hmm. I, I need that, you know, um, I can't go too long without it. I, I get really unmoored. So yeah. that's the only thing that I really do try to make sure happens. Sure. And the and rest of it is just out of my hands. I just am happy yeah. if some good work comes along. Mm -hmm. And you, like every other actor, you have undoubtedly, you've experienced dry spells, correct? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And have you ever, I mean, have you ever thought about quitting? Have you ever thought about, is it only no. ever been acting? No. It's only ever been acting. And I've been very lucky. I've worked more than I haven't. Sure. Um, you know, I've been very, very lucky. Uh, maybe I haven't been working on the types of things I want to be working on, but right. I have always been working. And, th and then there's that frustration. So there's the, mm. the the privilege of being able to work, but you're working on things that you don't want to be working on. <laughs> That's totally. a pretty strange situation to be in also. That's um, really realistic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all sorts of levels of like where you are. You, and you just really, you just want to be with like-minded people working mm. on something that makes you better. Mm -hmm. You know, you just want to learn about something along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but the only time I really thought about quitting was when I was at school. I hit a wall mm. in my training that was probably one of, you know, one of the greatest things to happen to me. But I, at the time, it was just excruciating and painful. Yes. And it was my third year at Juilliard, and I just got to a point where I could not walk and talk at the same time. And okay. for the first time in my life, I was on stage, and I didn't want to be there. I was doing Ellie in Heartbreak House. And I was terrible. I was just god awful. <laughs> and I could not find my way in. And I didn't understand the text. And I just couldn't relate to anyone. And it was misery. I would come off stage and just burst into tears. I just, I, I, I just, you know, the thing that it was like the spirit of the theater had just deserted me. And it was awful. Wow. And I went to, there was a brilliant teacher named John Sticks. He called me into his office and said, you know, so I hear you're thinking about dropping out of school. And I said, yeah, I am. He goes, w what you don't understand is that this is where you're supposed to fail. Oh, you're supposed to fail here. This is where you fail. And once you fail, then you can really start to learn. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that at the time, but he was absolutely right. 
you know, it's sort of, I, I was almost inevitable that I get to that point and then start to rework myself mm-hmm. and what I was doing. Yeah. Because what I, what I was doing was not working. <laughs> it did not work. Yeah. And I had to find a different way to, to, if I wanted to, you know, work on a different level, I had to find a different way in. Mm-hmm. It was the best thing that could have happened to me, but it was excruciatingly painful. <laughs> and it was really uncomfortable for about a year, like really okay. brutally uncomfortable for a full year. Wow. Okay. And, um, yeah. I really wanted to, to go join the Peace Corps is what I really wanted okay. to do. <laughs> and, um, That's fascinating. I was told to stick with it, to have faith that this was an important part of my training and and that it was a good thing. It was really a good thing. Hmm. Um, and they were right. And thank God. They right. were right. And thank God I listened to them. But it was, it was, it, and I just felt shame. I just, I just felt terrible. I just, I, I hated myself. I hated, I just thought I, this is, I'm wasting my time. This is a nightmare. It was awful. It was just awful. And you felt that way for a full year. Yeah. And I developed terrible stage fright. During oh my, gosh! Wow. Oh yeah, it was really bad. It was just like I just hit a real crucible, a real mm. white hot terrible time, and I was forced to grow in a different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and reconnect but I had with your to, passion. I had, I had to sit in it for a long, long and time. Earn it, yeah, and make it sustainable, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, and I guess school is truly the ideal place to do to have that kind of a crisis. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think there's also you know there's the very wrong thinking that if you get into a school like that, or if you get into any, any place that you're not allowed to fail there, mm. that you're only supposed to be great there. And once I, once I really understood that, of course, this is where you are supposed to be bad. Yeah. And you sort of have to be bad before you get better. Hmm. You have to allow yourself to be terrible. And it was a great lesson. And I take it with me, you know, like I have to be bad if I'm actually if I'm really working on something, it's not going to be good all the time. It's going right. to be bad. Like, but then when I do it again, it might get a little better. Right. And it's the, same, the same thing goes for writing. Like writing is about rewriting. Writing is not about mm-hmm. producing some magic thing, some beautiful, you know, um, Fabergé egg out of nowhere. Right. You know, right. first the egg is ugly. <laughs> Yes. And then you gotta blow out the yolk, and then you gotta paint it, and you're gonna mess that up. But you do it again, and then slowly, you know, with layering of work, if things get better and better and better and better, hmm. so you sort of have to be bad. You have to let yourself really suck in order <laughs> to uh, to explore something and and get you know have it be rooted, really rooted and good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think listeners to, of this podcast will be sort of weirdly relieved to hear um to hear that they have permission from laura linney to to be really bad (laughs) and also like to let the people you're working with be bad too like they're going through their their own process yeah don't pass judgment on someone who's working through something right you know be supportive be supportive and learn learn from them like, see what's happening. Yeah. Why is it not working? And then watch, like, be amazed when they figure it out and take the next step forward. It'll blow your mind. Cool. It's a wonderful thing to witness. Yeah. You mentioned earlier the idea that also you're not, it's not true that no actor has ever worked with spectacular writing all the time. Like, yeah, that's no. not realistic. It's like, you're yeah. going to yeah. you're gonna work with material that's not at its highest potential. That's right. And, and you know, sometimes things come together and sometimes they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you'll have experiences that are great. Yeah. And those are magical and you have to enjoy every second of those. Gotcha. And then sometimes you're going to be in productions that just <laughs> don't work and they're painful and it's awful and it's embarrassing, but you learn a lot. You're going to learn maybe more from those experiences. Absolutely you do. It's <laughs> it's humiliating, but they're important. So a, a 100% batting average is is impossible. Well, I wouldn't want that, quite frankly. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't, I don't think you grow a whole lot. Mm. You know, there's something to be said about grit and what totally. that will do for you. And and there's something also about forgiveness. You know, you mm. need to forgive yourself and let yourself get better and develop. Um, mm. 
but it's it's hard when we live in a in a world where culturally you know you're expected to be great all the time yes and you're sort of punished if you're not and that's just that just goes against what being an artist is all about yeah so it's about forgiving yourself when things aren't going great or when you are not at your very best yeah. but also like you said celebrating and really enjoying when it is going well yeah and also knowing that when you're in like a horrible period of time or a bad production like it's just one encapsulated period of time mm. it's going to be over <laughs> it's not who you are it's not all that you are although mm -hmm. that's what it feels like at the time it really does definitely but um you know they're they're it's good not to be spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, that's actually true. You know, it gives you, it gives you lessons about how to survive. Yeah. If, yeah. I mean, if everything's going swimmingly all the time, then when things suddenly do not, you're in for a rough, you're, you're in for a rough a patch. Very, very rough road. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, how do you memorize lines? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it depends on what it, what I'm learning it for. Hmm. Um, Which medium? Y y yes. And how much of it there is to learn. Oh. Um, but really, I try and know what the thought is behind the line. And then the lines come much easier. Oh, okay. If I understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. <laughs> and if I have personalized everything within the line, like if I'm talking about, you know, there was a barn that had a cow and I used to sit <laughs> under the tree and look at them. Like if I personalize that barn and I know exactly what that barn looks like and I know exactly how that cow smelled and what he sounded like and I remember exactly what it felt like to be under that tree, the line's going to come much faster. Mm -hmm. But with Lucy Barton, which was this one woman show that I did, which was me just flapping my mouth for 90 <laughs> minutes yes. with gorgeous, beautiful language that I wanted to get right, you know, that I... I knew I'm not a machine, so I was never going to be word perfect the entire time, but I really wanted to serve that language as, as, as well as I could. That, that took a long time and it was, it was really daunting. It took me three weeks to learn the first line because I was, wow. I think I was just so terrified and then the rest of it came much easier, but it was, hmm. um, so with that, there was really just like apply the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair and take okay. it bit by bit, like a huge, enormous thing. It was just learn it, just the, the agonizing work of learning it. And then once you know it, you have to get out of its way. You have to get out of your mm. own way so, mm -hmm. that it's, so that it's not just, you're not just reciting something. Mm -hmm. It actually has a purpose and it has a life within it. So when it comes out of your mouth, it has some sort of resonant life to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't sound canned. And that, so that's alive. Right. You, you can always kind of hear language when someone is either ahead of the language or behind the language or self-conscious about the language. Oh. It just becomes a little encased. Mm -hmm. And you can hear it in some, you can hear it in, in an actor's voice as opposed to when it's so deeply in the marrow of their bones. There's a, it, there's, it rings a truth that's really, mm. that's what you strive for. Right. And in a one person show, you are reacting to yourself. Is that right? Well, not necessarily. Or you're reacting to with Lu Lucy Barton was also like, a, there was no fourth wall. So mm -hmm. a lot of it was, you know, what it, a lot of it was, was to the audience. And then mm -hmm. there was also the difference between language, which is reacting to an interior uh, impulse or to mm -hmm. an exterior one, you know, in language will be different depending upon that as well. So, gotcha. you know, you can tear it apart and turn it all upside down. And, but at the end of the day, you need to know it. <laughs> yeah. You need to know it so well that it's not an issue. Right. You know, you sort of can't start working on something unless you really know it well. Hmm. Um, and I want to ask too, when you say personal, using that example of the, um, the barn and the smells, when you are picturing that barn and using that imagery or using that that uh, mm -hmm. the, those that thought process, is that creating a character that is experiencing those things and seeing those visions, or is that your memories? It sort of starts with just fantasizing about whatever it is you're thinking about, the reference, and then okay. and then through the eyes of the character, mm. through the 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 sensual life of the character. 
whether if they have, a, you know, but some characters don't care, you know, right, <laughs> so right. we also have to take that into it. You can't overwork something, you know, it has to be appropriate to, to character. And, and then you also can't overburden it. You know, it can't uh-huh. be, you know, you just, I just do that work and then I throw it away. Right. But I've done it so that when I say the word barn, it's, it's, it's not generic. Right. It means something, even if it's something, whatever that is, Exactly. whatever it is, but it means something. And hopefully that something bleeds through into the the word itself and an audience Mm. subconsciously will hear it. Yes. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Because that, okay. (laughs) This is what I really wanted to ask you about specifically with Ozark. Maybe this is the clumsiest transition ever, but I like, Go for it. <laughs> I just had this this burning question for you of like, you said this thing about Wendy. I, I can't even remember where you said this, but you have said that she doesn't know herself very well. Yeah, no, she doesn't. Yeah, And that is so fascinating to me. And it's got me thinking about like, so is your job as an actor to, like you're saying, to know these characters inside and out, to have their arc like in your in your marrow, as you're saying, but more often, is it true that more often than not, the characters that you're playing have nowhere near that level of self awareness? Yeah, some do and some don't. Uh huh. Some do and some don't. So it's almost but like, have, but you still have to do the work so that it's right percolating underneath. So you're doing the work of of um, <laughs> being. It's almost like you're. Are you pl- uh, playing ignorance? No, it's not ignorance at all. Okay. No, but with her, it's instinct. Instinct rather than. Yeah. Okay. Because there's something about the idea of Wendy not knowing herself and not knowing her family and that whole family not knowing themselves very well. Well, none, none of those people know, know themselves very well. And but that's... It's, it's a whole cast of characters of people who don't know themselves or each other. And right. as the show goes on, they learn more and more about themselves and more and more about each other. Mm-hmm. It's really fun to play. When things are revealed about someone to someone else, it's, it's fun. She's very reactive. Yeah. She's ext- she's impulsive. She's reactive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's, it, yeah. It goes back to what you were saying about TV being this thrilling, take it as it comes experience. Yes, absolutely. And so it, it worked well with the medium itself. Right. So when I made that decision, I was like, oh, this will, this will sit well regardless of what happens to this character. Okay. It will, it will, it will serve the medium that it's being written for. Exactly. Yeah. Because I often ask on this podcast, especially when we talk about TV, it's fascinating to ask, like, first of all, what were your impressions of the character? And then how have those impressions changed? And it sounds like Ozark is sort of the perfect example of the perfect way to talk about that because yeah. yeah, it's safe to say you didn't know anything about what would happen to Wendy and Wendy herself didn't know how she would be changed by the events of the story. Correct. Amazing. And but 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 I started with the premise of, and I remember talking to my showrunner about this before we even shot the pilot, mm-hmm. that there would be themes of identity, okay. like if this is about identity. Mm-hmm. And I started with the premise of this is someone who doesn't know themselves very well. Wow. And this is a family that does. We don't know each other, and we don't know ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I started there. And it's almost like that puts you more in the moment throughout the process. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Very cool. And then, and also you, and I sort of believe if, if, if you're not surprised every day, if something doesn't surprise you, like why, why do it? Mm-hmm. Like you have to be careful about being too knowing. Like you do all this work, but you don't do it to be, to encase yourself and to be knowing. Right. You do it so you can discover other things. Amazing. Okay. You know, you do it to keep it alive, not to limit yourself. Because mm-hmm. when people come on too knowing, they've already made every decision. Sure. And decisions are made and it's sort of plotted out and there's there can be kind of no life to it. But you should be surprised every day. One thing should surprise you every day. Just one. <laughs> okay. So it's like there's two forms of over-preparing and one allows for flexibility and one does not. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. And with Ozark 2, is it safe to say, I mean, I don't, I, we can't speak to Jason's exact process, but because the two of you are playing this complicated married couple, mm-hmm. does that same idea of like, you have no idea, you don't know the first thing about each other and how, right. how they right. react to different things. Is that how you guys chart this marriage? 
Uh, it's not, uh, I don't know. Jason works very differently than I do. Okay. And I, I love working with him because of that. Um, you know, he has spent his entire life on sets. Mm -hmm. So he's very attuned to how, te how television and film works. Um, the way that I know the theater, he knows, mm -hmm. he knows film and TV the way that I know theater. Like it's just, I've been doing it for so long and have been doing it since I, I've been around it since I was a child. There's a, there's just an understanding of what it, it will do for you. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's great that way. And, and then I'm, but we don't talk a whole lot about that. Okay. Stuff. You get to a point also where there's just, there's such trust with people who you've worked with for years. Hmm. And, and it's, it's fun to watch someone else work in a very different way. And hmm. then how does that ignite your own process? I mean, it's so fascinating to hear about this, where you're providing such a window into your process because it is about like prepare, prepare, prepare. And then, we we've heard it before. Like you throw it out. The, throw it out. Get. You have to throw it out. Yeah. Right. And a lot of the a lot of the preparation is really just so that you know the story. Like a okay. lot of the nerdy kind of work that I do mm -hmm. is just a way for me to know the story well. I've, I, it means I just get in it and I get my hands in it and I roll around in it and I, you know, I make charts. I do all sorts of oh, nerdy cool. stuff. All sorts of nerdy stuff. But just basically so that I can walk on from us and then it allows me to start mm -hmm. it, it gives me the opportunity to start something but it, it certainly doesn't determine what's going to happen no you know or how i'm going to play something especially when you're opposite someone else that's right and also you're on a set you've never been on you're in clothes you've never seen you're mm -hmm. sometimes you're working with actors you just met that day mm -hmm. like it just it roots me so that i can then be and it cuts my nerves down really Sure. Me I mean, it's nervous because I feel like I've done everything I could do. So now let's see what happens. Oh, fascinating. And then it sort of takes the pressure off me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, so nerves are, are, are an issue. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and I learned early if I'm not prepared, I, I'm, I get nervous. Uh huh. So the more work I do, the, the more relaxed I'll be. And if I'm relaxed, my father had this great expression was if you're, if you're relaxed, you can be precise. And if you're precise, mm -hmm. you can be fierce. Ooh. So there's something about, you can be really specific if mm -hmm. you're relaxed, mm -hmm. if you're nervous and then everything gets a little general and you're not in control of it and there's blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're a mess, but if you're relaxed, then you can really, um, you can be agile. You know? Right. General is such an interesting, it, go, it kind of goes back to what you're saying about like, there, there are certain things in your control and certain things out of your control, for example, on a set and if you're focused and I guess, yeah, relaxed, then you're mm -hmm. only focused on the things that are with, that are on your plate. Right. Yeah. And if you're relaxed also, you can take things in. Uh, Normally mm -hmm. if you're nervous, it's, you're just, it's you harder to listen here. You can't respond. You can't, yeah. you're just so trapped in your own head that you can't, you know, and nerves are just something that you learn to deal with. I mean, everyone is going to deal with nerves. <laughs> everyone is particularly when you're just starting out. You have yes. no idea what's coming. You're all of a sudden you're on a movie set and there are people around you and they're hair and makeup people in your face before the camera rolls and mm -hmm. someone's yelling there and someone's moving equipment over here. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you can lose perspective very quickly. Right. And is all of this, is all of this true also for auditions? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Are auditions a totally different beast or do you approach them no, in much the same way? Of are, they kind of are a different beast. Mm. And I, and I realized I would get incredibly nervous mm -hmm. when I first started. I was like, why am I so nervous? Like, why am I nervous other than just the nerves? Like what can I do to help myself not be so nervous? Mm -hmm. And I realized that I would look down at the paper that had, you know, the scene on it and I would lose my place sometimes. Okay. And that would make me incredibly nervous. So I started marking up my script so that if mm. I looked down, I could find my place instantly. And that calmed me down. Okay. I mean, yeah. I was still nervous, Yeah. but it was better. So it's trial and error. Yeah. And you've got to figure out your own technique. Right. This is where you are a student in life and you have to figure it out on your own. And you have to be diagnostic and you have to know yourself well enough about like, how do I help myself here? What's the best way in here? How do I, how do I do this? Um, yeah. And how do I demystify it so that I don't feel completely out of control? 
Yes. I'm not is, able it's to problem do, solving. That I'm not able to do what I know how to do. Yeah. Diagnostic is such a great way of thinking about it because I was, I was going to ask you, has there been a specific time? Probably not on Ozark, but we've, we talked about the, you're not always working with the greatest material. Has there been a time that you are so challenged that you have to pull out all of these tricks that you're talking about? Oh, and, sure. <laughs> <laughs> all oh, of the yeah. nerdy stuff. And then it's still really bad, but you know, at least you're trying. <laughs> At least you're trying something. And then there are times where like all that sort of work will overwhelm something. So you have to sort of really look oh. at the material and be like, how does this, how much can this material hold? It's like oh, okay. putting too much weight on a paper towel, on a wet paper towel. Mm. Like it'll fall through. If you overburden it too much, it's just not gonna, you know, so you have to figure out like, how do I marry how, what I'm doing to this material? Mm-hmm. What can it hold? What does it, what does it do that I don't have to worry about? Where do I need to help highlight something? Yeah. Like, what do I, what's my job? What's right. My job? What can I let go of that I may be holding on to? And how do I help if your director knows what they're doing, which, uh-huh. you know, is you, hopefully that's the case. <laughs> you need to figure out like, how do I help them tell the story they want to tell? Mm-hmm. You yeah. have to be in service to, to a lot of people. Be of a lot service. Of people. Yes. You have to really be in service to the script, to the writer, to the director, to your fellow actors, to the, to everybody. Mm-hmm. You just, you know, you're in service to, to a bigger thing. Yes. You've got your one role and it's about maximizing your ability to contribute and not much more than that. It's about helping. Yeah. Yeah. Like how do I help tell this story? Amazing. And how do I help my fellow actors do what they need to do? Even if it's subpar, I mean, I pre- I really appreciate yeah. your candor on that. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, how do I help someone who's really struggling in a scene? Yeah. Someone who's so nervous they can barely see straight. Mm-hmm. Someone who mm-hmm. doesn't really understand what the scene's about. Like, how do I help them? How do I and how do I keep the scene on the train tracks? Mm-hmm. And you certainly can't do any of that if you have not done your preparation and right. your preparation yeah. to the point of being flexible. Yeah. But it's, it's really like my hat is off to people who go on, have one day on something. You know, they're walking yeah. to the set they've never been on. They don't know anybody. They don't know what's going on. They're taking in the vibe of the set. You know, some sets are happy, some are not. Hmm. You know, so it's, it's really hard to like sort of jump in and jump out. So I always try and be as available as I possibly can to, to people who are just in and out. You know, because they do, a, they're very important. They provide a tremendous service to any show. They give texture sure. and, and a new sense of life and they breathe fresh air into scenes. And, but it's, it's not easy to do that. Like I'm warm, I'm working every day. So I'm warm and ready to go. Mm. And people who, who come and maybe haven't been on a set in a while. And, you know, mm-hmm. they might need a little bit more time and they should be able to have that. And they should not be, they should feel good about it, mm-hmm. about like having a process. They shouldn't feel that they have to nail something right away. That's just not realistic mm-hmm. and usually not your best work. Mm-hmm. That's lovely. We, we got to be realistic. It's true. Yeah. And, and kind and forgiving to ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's not easy to do what we do. <laughs> it's really not. Sure. You know, there's a, you know, it's not instant pudding. And I, I say that a lot, but it's not, <laughs> not just add water and go, you know, it just isn't. It can be, but hmm. there's my pull quote for this whole interview. It's not instant pudding. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Laura, thank you. This is so wonderful. Can I ask you some not quite rapid fire, but very backstagey questions? Sure. How did you get your equity card? Do you remember? I was an understudy for six degrees of separation. On what stage? Uh, well, it started on the 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 Mitzi and then went up and went upstairs to the Beaumont. Oh, yeah. very cool. Yeah, I was very proud of that. And what about your SAG card? My SAG card, I believe, was for a commercial, I assume, mm-hmm. I think, or it was for uh, Lorenzo's Oil. Mm. But I think it was for a commercial. And you mentioned your agent. Your agent had seen you mostly, or knew that you were mostly doing theater, but saw in you that you should try the the camera work. I guess. <laughs> God bless him, because I wouldn't have done it otherwise. And commercials were part of that. Yes, commercials were great because mm. 
I, I'd never been on a set in my life. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd grown up in the theater. I'd grown up backstage. I'd grown up in rehearsal spaces. So I knew the theater inside and out. And I didn't know what it was like to walk on a set. I didn't know what all those mm-hmm. people were doing. I, there was no back wall. There was no, I didn't know what to do. So being on a commercial set was great because it didn't matter if I was good or not. It really, oh. you know, the acting was not important. Right. And, you know, so it gave me the opportunity to just sort of be on a set and look around and see, okay, this is what this is. Okay. Maybe didn't push you as an actor on a technical level, but more yeah. like pushed you as an actor on like onset experience. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that, you know, and every time I would walk on set, I'd be a little less nervous, you know, because I sort of totally. knew what I was walking into. Totally. I mean, that's just a part of the realistic thing of everyone's going to be nervous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a human being, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And human beings like the unknown makes people can make people nervous. Or it sure does. One of the two. Yeah, it's that mix of the two. Like the, this crisis we're facing right now, it's it's so unknown. Yeah, it's, it is. <laughs> on a good day, it's sort of a it's a nice unknown, but not all the time. There's something I've been watching Frozen Two because for my son. Yes. And watching it before the pandemic and after the pandemic. <laughs> is a very different experience. Yeah. I get very emotional watching it now. Wow, yeah, yeah. That movie's beautiful. Isn't it? It's fantastic. It's really good. I know, I love it. (laughs) Well, that actually brings me to the next backstage question. What is one performance every actor should see and why? Oh, Lord, wow. (laughs) Um, Does not have to be Frozen 2. Oh, God, there's so many, there's so many. Dodsworth, I think Ruth Chatterton and Dodsworth. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's also like historically re- really important. Mm. You know, she sort of changed, you know, there was a, there was a depth of psychology to that performance mm. that I don't, I don't, I think was unusual for that time and for that genre. Mm. So Ruth Chatterton and Dodsworth. Excellent. Excellent answer. Um, what is your worst audition horror story? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. There's so many. There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you just got to have a sense of humor about it and not take it personal. Mm-hmm. You know, you just have to not take it personally. But I've been in rooms where casting directors were exhausted and tired and just didn't want to see anything, didn't care. I've, I've been in, I had to, a TV commercial where I had to dance around like a chicken for a oh my gosh. chicken sauce was absurd and humiliating. I've, I've worked like I was flown out for a, a, uh, an audition with a big, huge star who was just an asshole, you know, just was awful. (sighs) You know, you make, I mean, I was doing a play at the time. So I flew out after the evening show on Sunday and, you know, and then flew all the way back for the Tuesday night show. And there was just no sense of, ugh, it was just awful. So there's, there's been, (laughs) there's a whole bunch of them and you got to just like leave them where Jesus flung them, you know, just right. Leave them them off and move on. You don't want to work with them anyway, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let it go. Yeah. Yeah. And how? <laughs> <laughs> and laugh. And laugh. Yeah. Yeah. And then relive it on Backstage's podcast. That's right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Last question. What, what do you have a number one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? I'm thinking maybe especially yeah. of that, that one year you had in Juilliard where it was just your worst year to be an actor. I think it's just to be a little, to be a little kinder to yourself. Mm. I think more than anything, mm. you know, you gotta, you have to be kind to yourself in the process. Mm-hmm. And I, and I'm lucky because I, I think the greatest, the best thing I had going for me is that I have a really good disposition for this business. I really do. Okay. Um, like I don't get overly stung if I don't get a part, I'm not competitive. I'm not jealous mm. that way. I'm like, my focus is, is, in the right place, I think, I hope, mm. I hope, but I think I would be kinder to myself. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That's excellent advice. Laura, thank you. This has all been my just, pleasure. It's been my pleasure. It's so great. So, so happy to speak with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad we were able to connect uh, from afar. Me too. And, um, I, and I hope I run into you in person one day. Absolutely. Yes. When things are up and running again, I mean, Next time we're at the theater, it's going to be a really, really, truly magical oh, experience. Can you imagine how exciting it's going to right. be when the theater opens up again? Can you imagine? We are not taking anything for granted. How exciting it's going to be. Yeah. I really look forward to that. Totally, totally. 
Well, thank you so much, Laura. And uh, congratulations on Ozark season three, too. It's really awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Stay safe. You too. Have a good one. Okay, you too. Bye. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.